Hello, and welcome to People of the Pod, brought to you by American Jewish Committee. Each week, we take you beyond the headlines to help you understand what they all mean for America, Israel, and the Jewish people. I'm your host, Manya Brashear Pashman. Over 200 hostages are being held by the Iran-backed terror group Hamas after its terrorist attack against Israel and the massacre of over 1,400 Israelis on October 7th. American Jewish Committee and more than 110 Jewish organizations from more than 40 countries have urged the United Nations and all governments to secure the immediate and unconditional release of the hostages. The condition of many of the hostages remains unknown, yet we know some are in dire need of urgent medical care. With me to discuss her efforts to bring back her 12-year-old and 16-year-old sons is Renana Gomez. Renana, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, your two sons were kidnapped from Kibbutz near Oz by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. You were on the phone with your sons as Hamas terrorists were breaking into your home. I cannot imagine what you have been going through over the past two weeks. Could you please tell listeners what happened that morning at 6.30 a.m.? Yes, I was on another kibbutz at that Saturday morning with my spouse. I have a partner living on another kibbutz, on another community near the Gaza border, which is a 15 minutes drive away. I'm divorced and my ex-husband lives 400 meters away from me. He's also a member of my kibbutz, of my community. And uh, the boys just usually sleep at my place. You know, this is how they prefer it. And since they're not very young children anymore, we let them choose. So they were alone at home. And he was at his place with his girlfriend, with his partner, who I love to bits. Um, and about 6.30 in the morning, we all woke up to the red alert, which is unfortunately something which became a routine and we're used to. Since I was also on a kibbutz on the Gaza border, all communities at the Gaza border had red alerts and rockets flying over, hundreds of rockets flying over on a completely surprise attack. We just didn't see it coming whatsoever. I called my boys as I was running to the safe room at the place I was in to make sure that they're in the safe room at my place. And as the safe room is the eldest uh, son's bedroom, he was there, but he made sure that his little brother was also there. So they were in the safe room. And every couple of minutes I spoke to them to see that they were okay. At a certain point, uh, they said they started hearing gunshots outside the house, and I could hear gunshots outside the house I was in. Again, it was a completely <sighs> well-planned and well-executed attack on all communities at the same time, so no one could go outside. And I told them it was probably the army defending them, you know, the keeping us safe. 30 minutes later or so, I can't remember. I've lost track of time, to be honest, at the morning. We started getting text messages from other members of the community saying terrorists are walking outside freely, breaking into houses, trying to get people out. I was begging neighbors and people from the community to go and see and to go, go and see them, go and be with them, you know, keep, try and help them, but no one could go outside. And there were probably over a hundred terrorists walking around getting into houses. So there was no, not a chance that anyone could help. At some point, I asked my elder brother, who's also a member of the community, to call my eldest and tell him how to lock the door. The doors don't lock in the safe room because the safe rooms were planned against missiles and rockets attacks and against earthquakes. So they actually want you to have the door being able to open from the outside so they can take you out. So they don't lock. But, you know, there's certain technic ways to try and keep them locked. So I asked him to call my eldest and tell him how to do it. And then I later found out that he held the door like hell and he fought for that door. But he didn't make it. And about an hour later, about two hours after the attack started, they called me and said they hear someone breaking in, breaking the door, breaking in, walking in the house. And a couple of minutes later, I could hear 
Arabic speaking outside. The door opened. And my youngest said, please don't take me, I'm too young. He was always good at manipulations, but this time it didn't work. And they took them. That was the last I've heard from them. It's almost two weeks now, and I've nothing. I've heard nothing. I know nothing of their whereabouts. I know nothing about the conditions they're held in, whether they eat, whether they sleep, and whether they're still alive. I'm so sorry to make you relive that, but I also know that it's important that you share your story with the wider world. It is. It is. I know. Uh, this is this is all I can do at the moment. You know, and so it means a lot to me that you're actually giving me the platform. Because what I need your audience to to do is to enlist to the effort to get them released now, to get my boys home alive now. They shouldn't be there. They take children hostage. 80 people out of our small community, which only is about 400 people, 80 people were taken hostage from the age of six months to the age of 86, people who need medicine, people who need medical care. It's just plain children that needs their mother. Uh, I later found out that my ex-husband and his girlfriend were also taken hostage from their house. My hope is that they've met and they're together. As 80 people were taken, my hope is that someone that they know is with them to support them and to help them. Uh, that's the story, you know, as a mother to other mothers, just try and imagine it was your child being kept there just for one hour, let alone 13 days. Uh, my heart goes out to every mother, even in the Gaza Strip. You sometimes get in the news in Israel, you sometimes get news like, um, 14 year old terrorist was killed tonight at a terror attack. And I always, my heart goes out to them and I say, you know, he's 14, he's someone's child. But what kind of a mother raises such monsters? Of course, um, listeners who are hearing this can go to ajc.org slash bring them home to send a letter to the United Nations, send a letter to Congress to demand swift action to release the hostages. Um, I know that you are pushing for swift action to release your sons and the other hostages. Who have you met with? Who have you talked to about bringing your sons home? And what can be done? Well, I've met anyone who is willing to meet me. I was mainly trying to get the media, uh, international media, to hear my voice and to to get people around the world to hear us. I think the international community has a lot of tools and there's many ways you can help just by putting pressure, as you just suggested, by putting the right pressure in the right places in order to release them. Obviously, I want all of them to be released. There's over 200 people kept in the Gaza Strip, as far as we know. I think there's more, but you know, it's not for me to say. What we need you to do is to approach your governments and ask them to release those civilians that are held. We don't even know, you know, again, in what conditions, and especially release those 40 or so children. Children under the age of 18, from babies to teenagers, they are not part of this game, I'm sorry. They are not bargain chips at the war game. Get them free now, without any conditions whatsoever. Renana, are you getting any explanations or theories from diplomats, people that you're speaking with, on why they're holding your sons and other children like this? To be honest, until two weeks ago, I saw us as neighbors, and I thought there was a mutuality between us, you know, that we could have a future together, those two people have a mutual economy, have mutual relations, even have mutual cultures, but I don't think we do. I can't even try and 
get into these terrorists' heads and the way they think. Because what they did is not just taking soldiers hostages in order to bargain them, to trade them for prisoners. What they did was to rape and decapitate and murder just for the sake of fun. You know, they came in with had cameras to have this horror filmed and put on Facebook and on TikTok. So I can't even begin to try and understand, but I reckon they probably want to bargain them for their prisoners, which as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't care. It's, I think the actions they took cannot be justified in normal rules of war. I can't explain. It's not for the bargaining. It's for fun. Are you being told there are limits to what diplomats can do? Or is anyone telling you their hands are tied? Or are you getting unequivocal, unbridled assurance that everything is being done? I'm not really told anything at the moment, but I'm not an expert. I understand that not everything can be told. And if there are efforts being done, which I hope there are, they can't share it with 200 families. My hopes are that anyone with the right mind understands that this situation cannot go on and that children cannot stay held by terrorists for not even one hour, let alone a day or a month. And that has to be over, no matter what. I don't care if the war still goes on after that. And I don't believe there's any other way to get them released but diplomatic pressure. I think this is the way to do it. But I'm not sure there's anyone to negotiate with. So, you know, the other side is so different to us and their morales are so different from ours, apparently. Are you traveling places to meet with government officials? And do those government officials include Israel, America, beyond that? I'm willing to do anything to get my kids back home and to get everyone's kids back home. I have another daughter, my eldest, who's 21, who was also in Niroz at that horrible horror day and who's traumatized. Thank God her boyfriend was around and held the door and luckily they got out alive, but very, very deeply scarred. And I have to take that into consideration while making decisions about traveling far away. But I'm doing my best by Zoom. I'm trying to get my voice heard in any way I can under those conditions. And I still have her to think of. And she's all I have at the moment. So she deserves her mother to be around. Even she's willing for me to do anything to get her father and her brothers back. Where are you staying now? Uh, we've been evacuated to a beautiful hotel suite in Eilat. My boys love Eilat. I was here with them two months ago on a summer vacation. Uh, it took me years after I got divorced to get to this point where I can take them to a summer holiday on my own. Uh, so it was very meaningful to all soul. And we had a great time, so I'm finding it very, very hard, very hard to to walk around in Eilat, but uh, everyone from my what's left of my community, of what was Niroz, everyone were evacuated to this hotel, and we found it very important to be together. This community, you know, has it's like a big family to us. This is why we decided to stay here with them. It's very hard because it's very far away from everywhere in Israel. I know for people in the States, internal flights seem like a normal bus, but uh, for us it's not. But at least it feels safe-ish. I don't think anyone who's now staying here could bear even one more alarm. People ran for their lives. People fought terrorists. People jumped out of burning houses. People fell out of windows. People were hiding in bushes. People were faking themselves dead. There's not even a, a, a I can't even start to describe, you know, for me, the horror was the, the fact that my children were taken away. 
but other people experienced horrors themselves. Um, so we're here with our big family, um, kibbutz, trying to recover from ashes. Much of the world's attention is on what's going on now in Gaza. What do you have to say to journalists who are covering this war? A, the last thing I want as a human being, as a mother, as a woman, if we were to run the world, it wouldn't happen. Just saying. But um, the last thing I would have wanted is war. You know, we've had so many in the last few years. This is the last thing we need. This is the last thing the Gaza people need. And the people in Gaza are used as human shields. Even their children, like I said, terrorists who are 14, terrorists, their children. Why are they carrying guns? Why are there summer camps teaching them how to use guns and to become terrorists? My heart goes out to every mother there. And I wish we didn't have to have a war. And I wish we could live a better life. And I think the people in Gaza had that chance. We walked out of the Gaza Strip 20 years ago, took villages, complete villages out. And it was a very difficult action to do in Israel, which, you know, we still bleed on it nowadays, politically and, and socially. And we gave them the opportunity to become an independent state. And they gave the keys to a terrorist organization, which uses all the money that the EU and whoever is giving them in order to weaponize themselves and in order to become terrorists and to educate their children to become terrorists. I used to tell my children all the time, your life is so much better than children in Gaza. You have education, you have running water, you have electricity. And you have the morals that the Jewish world gives to their children of equality, of mutuality, of giving away from yourself in no wish to get something in return. The other side does the opposite. We treasure life as Jews and they treasure death. So I'm sorry, but my sympathy is gone. I want my children back home now, alive. Afterwards, we can speak about having a war or not having a war, the conditions they're in, the humanitarian solutions. But the world should know that what happens there is not an independent state. It's a terrorist organization holding civilians Hostages, their own civilians. My heart goes out to every child and every mother there. It's not their fault. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective, sharing your family's story. And I am praying and we are all doing everything we can to help you get your sons and the other hostages home. And I pray that that happens very soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I just want them. I just want my boys back home alive now. And I want you to help us do it in any way you can. Thank you so much for having me. If you would like to help make a difference, go to AJC.org slash bring them home. There you can urge the United Nations and members of Congress to secure the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages being held by Hamas terrorists in Gaza. Thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by AJC. Our producer is Atara Lakritz. Our sound engineer is TK Broderick. You can subscribe to People of the Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or learn more at AJC.org slash People of the Pod. The views and opinions of our guests don't necessarily reflect the positions of AJC. We'd love to hear your views and opinions or your questions. You can reach us at peopleofthepod at AJC.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to tell your friends, tag us on social media with hashtag people of the pod, 
and hop on to Apple Podcasts to rate us and write a review to help more listeners find us. Tune in next week for another episode of People of the Pod. 